Hello folks, we are talking about where are people distributed. Um, this is your first video for Unit 2. You should take a second to set up your notes to look like this sample page here. So let's just do a quick overview of population. Um, and it's important for you to know right off the bat that humans are not distributed uniformly across the earth. There is no even distribution of people. Um, we see them highly clustered in particular places, whereas other places are very sparsely inhabited. And so you can see here um, by this uh, map that uh, this place right here, the Sahara Desert, is very sparsely inhabited, right? Or up here, the Siberian tundra is very sparsely inhabited. Um, so um, just another overview, there's 7.5 billion people on the Earth's surface today, and this is more than any other time throughout our entire history. And the world's population has increased at a faster rate during, um, or from the time since the 1950s, so about here until today than it ever had been before. And it's really important for you to know that virtually all of that population growth that we see is happening in developing countries. Okay, so let's talk about the distribution of the world's people. So people originally settled in places that were low-lying, meaning there's not a lot of hills, um, with fertile soil, and a temperate climate. We see most people living near an ocean or a river valley rather than the interior of a landmass. And then we also see people settling near transportation or trade routes. So the big idea here is people are living near water um, in places where they can grow food. Right? And so this is even true for the United States. Um, our population is highly clustered on the coasts of our country. Okay, so let's talk about the distribution of world population in the four major clusters. And these clusters meet all of those needs that I just talked to you about. Temperate climate, fertile soil, low-lying, near some type of body of water, um, able to grow food. So first one we're going to talk about is East Asia. So in East Asia, uh, we see one-fourth of the world's total population. And in East Asia, we have to consider China. This is the world's most populous country with 1.34 billion people. And um, when we're looking at the distribution of people in China, you can see our population is clustered here in this eastern region near the coast. Um, and these are some um, fertile river valleys here as well. And our interior of this region is very sparsely um, inhabited because of climate and some physical features, which we'll get into later. So the second cluster that we're going to talk about is South Asia. Another one-fourth of the world's population live here, and India is our major player in South Asia. Um, population is really concentrated among the plains of the Ganges River here um, and near India's two coastlines with the Arabian Sea and then the Bay of Bengal. And most of the people living in India are actually farmers um, living in uh, rural areas um, attempting to work the land. Europe is our third population cluster, and you can see here on this density map where most Europeans are living in this region right here. <clears throat> Three-fourths of inhabitants in Europe actually live in cities, and fewer than 5% of people living in Europe are farmers. So this is much different from what we just talked about in East Asia and South Asia. Um, some major populations are near rivers and coal fields. Uh, that's why we see so much population here near Germany and France. Um, and then also we see high concentrations of populations in historic capital cities in Europe. And then our last cluster we're going to talk about is Southeast Asia. Um, Indonesia is in Southeast Asia, and that's our major player here. You can see on this cartogram um, it's very large, as well as the Philippines. Uh, but you can also see the breakdown of the density on this map. 
Um, so Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous country, and there are 13,677 islands that make up Indonesia. Um, but we see the majority of population um, living here near Jakarta. Um, and just like South Asia and East Asia, uh, the majority of people are farmers uh, in this country. So let's talk about those sparsely populated regions here for a minute. So people want to live in places where they can survive with relative ease and comfort. They want to be able to grow food um, and they want to live in moderate climates or temperate climates. So where can people not live? Okay, there are the five twos that I'm going to talk to you about here. People don't want to live in places um, in physical environments that are too dry, too wet, too cold, too hot, or too mountainous, right? Um, and so that brings us to the idea of ecumen. And this is a term that you will need to be very familiar with. The world's ecumen is the portion of the Earth's surface that is inhabitable by humans, places people can live. So 75% of our world's population lives on just 5% of the Earth's surface. Okay, so that is a huge number of people and a very small amount of the Earth's surface. But you also have to keep in mind when we're looking at that statistic that about 71% of uh, the Earth's surface is taken up by oceans, so we don't see a lot of people living in those. And the places that people aren't living, like I said, are places that are um, too dry, right? These are too dry for farming, and those take up about 20% of our Earth's surface area. So I mentioned earlier the Sahara Desert, uh, the Gobi Desert, um, and the Australian Outback. Those are three major places where it's just too dry. Um, places that are too wet. If you have very high levels of precipitation, attention, sorry, um, then that combination of rain and heat rapidly depletes the nutrients from the soil. So we can't see a lot of people living and farming there. An example of that is the Amazon rainforest. Um, cold lands, uh, obviously these are mostly near uh, the North Pole, and then you can't see on this map, but Antarctica at the South Pole. Um, obviously they're covered in ice, so you can't really grow anything there. And then highlands, these are places are, you know, too mountainous, where mountains are steep and snow covered, um, and they're not great for growing food. So again, make sure you're familiar with the five twos and the concept of ecumen. Okay, lastly, we're going to talk about population density measures. Okay, so there are three types of population density. Um, so let's talk about um, what it is first. Population density is the number of people occupying an area of land. And this is usually expressed in the number of people per square mile or per square kilometer. So when I'm talking to you guys, I'm going to use square miles because that's what you're used to here in the United States. So, um, let me show you these equations. Um, so, the three types of population density are arithmetic, physiological, and agricultural. And so, to find arithmetic population density, you're going to divide the total population by the land area in square miles. For physiological, you're going to divide the total population by arable land. Um, and what that means is it's taking into account that not all land is farmable, right? Arable means that you can farm and produce food on land. So this takes out all of those places that are too hot, too dry, too hilly, um, that people can't farm on. And then lastly is agricultural density, and this is the amount of farmers divided by the arable land. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth about each of these now. Okay, so arithmetic density. This is the, um, like I said, total number of people divided by the total land area. And this is used most frequently to talk about population density, um, and it's the most simple explanation. Um, however, it explains where people are located, but it doesn't really account for the unequal distribution of population. So let's look at an example. Um, China is an example of how arithmetic population density might not be accurate. We know that about 
94% um, of China's population lives in this eastern region. And so the arithmetic population density doesn't take into account this hugely uninhabited region in China. And it's the same here in the United States, right? So we have a lot of land area, but this place that we call here uh, the Great Plains is very sparsely inhabited. And we see the majority of our populations near the coasts. So this arithmetic population density doesn't take into account that unequal distribution of population. Physiological density, um, remember, is the um, total population uh, divided by the amount of arable land in a country. So remember, arable means that land is suited for agriculture. And if, they, if you have a country that has a high physiological density, this means that they put a greater pressure on their land to produce food. So um, this is much more useful when we're trying to determine an area's carrying capacity, right? Uh, the population that can be supported by the available resources. And so when you look here on this map, you can see countries like Colombia, the Western Sahara, Egypt, um, Sri Lanka, uh, Oman, South Korea, Japan, and Papua New Guinea have the highest physiological densities. This means that they have the least amount of arable land to provide for their people. And so let's look at a few examples to help describe these differences between arithmetic and physiological densities. So for example, Egypt's arithmetic population density is 87. Yet, the physiolo physiological density is much, much higher at 3,011. And this is because the majority of Egypt's land uh, falls within the Sahara Desert, you can see here. So this means that it is not arable. It is unsuitable for agriculture. And so we see 95% of Egyptians living in this Nile River Valley Delta. Right? This is where the land is most fertile, um, and it is the most livable part of Egypt. So this is actually just 3% of the total land area. And so only 3% of the total land area is able to um, grow agriculture for these people, which explains this very high physiological density. Another example, as I talked about previously, is China. The arithmetic density is 140, but the physiological density is 998. And this is because the high cluster of population on the east, where land is more arable, um, and we see these places that are mostly uninhabited, like the Gobi Desert and the Plateau of Tibet here, which is very mountainous, um, that does not allow people to live in that area or farm much in that area. Okay, the last type of density we're going to talk about is agricultural density. This is the ratio of farmers to the amount of arable land, okay? And this really accounts for economic differences and differences in development more than anything. And so developed countries have very low agricultural densities because farming technology allows for fewer farmers while still feeding a lot of people. So, for instance, we have huge tractors in the United States. Um, we have access to herbicides and pesticides to help our crops grow. Um, and then we also have um, intellectuals looking into the best types of farming methods, right? So, like bioengineering. However, in less developed countries, we see a higher agricultural density because they need more manpower to produce food, right? They need more people to work the land rather than machinery, and this is because they're less economically developed.